out of you soldiers. I've had more caffeine than solid food today. Also, if you see my plants or my hair like moving, uh, it's because I have two fans on opposite sides of me and I'm just playing a fun time bomb game of how long it takes for my hair to just blow into my lip gloss. Also, do you like my shirt? Do you like my shirt? Don't you wish that you could have a shirt like this? Well, now you can because I recently became an affiliate with Inkwell Threads. Uh, so that's where you can get the sick wearables that I have on right now. And you can use my code, a model who's red, to get 20% off your order. And I will leave all that in the description below. If you don't know me, hi, my name's Rachel. I read a whole lot of stuff. And today I thought it would be fun to talk about my top 10 favorite books of all time. Now this list is subject to change in the future. I'm always finding new things. In fact, I found what I would consider one of my top books of all time just last month. When I originally thought of this video, I thought, oh, that's just gonna be something fun and easy and quick that I can just, you know, bang out filming and throw up on the channel and be easy. But then I realized it's gonna be really difficult to keep this video entertaining because it's just gonna be me going, I love this like 10 trillion times. And like all these books are the exact same book. Like, trust me, I know. We got some dark fantasy. We got some whimsical dark fantasy. We got some romantic whimsical dark fantasy. You're gonna watch this video and just be like, damn, she really hit shuffle on that Spotify playlist. You can probably even just see it from what's behind me, but I tend to gravitate towards fantasy and gothic macabre stuff. I love playing with dreams and reality and time, real meta fantasy. So stuff about like sentient libraries or magical librarians, any kind of creepy nature magic, just speaks to something deep within my little rotted soul, like a cursed forest, or if a creature can only be described by what it's not like, or if it like has too many appendages or not enough of them. Oh, that's my shit right there. But then I also like some fluffy sweet romance in there as well. And you know what? I'm not gonna apologize for that. If you're here, you clicked on this video for me and my opinions. So without further ado, grab a drink, grab a snack, and we shall discuss the whimsical dark fairy tale masterpieces that I consider my top 10 favorites of all time. Now these are in no particular order. However, I am actually going to talk about a book that I think I can say is my favorite book of all time. And that is The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. I know a lot of people don't like this book. It is super freaking weird. And even I'm not sure exactly what happened to it. And that's why I love it. The Starless Sea is about a magical library that exists outside of space and time. And the only way to get to the library is if it offers you a door. And when it offers you a door, it will give you a motif of a key, a bee, and a sword. The key, the bee, and the sword. <laughs> Watch my tattoo tour video there. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have a lot of tattoo references in this video, by the way. Our main character, Zach, is a college student who had a door offered to him when he was younger, but he didn't end up taking it. And now he has a chance to enter the library again, but he ends up being in the middle of this mystery that exists in space and time between dimensions and multiple generations of people. There is a plot line in here. Um, in fact, there's multiple plot lines, if you can find them. They're all just kind of existing in pocket dimensions that sometimes overlap. There's a lot of weird one-off chapters of characters that you never meet again. There's a lot of very meta analysis of magic and magic users. And I love that over the top, whimsical, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey type of fantasy novel. But what I love about this so much is the writing. So let me read you an example. Everything whispers the story here. The sea and the bees whisper and I listen and I try to find the shape of it all, where it has been and where it is going. New stories wrap themselves around the old ones. The ancient stories that moths whisper to flame. This one wears thin in the places that have been told and retold. There are holes to fall into. Each door will lead to a harbor on the starless sea if someone dares to open it. Little distinguishes them from regular doors. Some are simple, others are elaborately decorated. Most have doorknobs waiting to be turned, though others have handles to be pulled. These doors will sing silent siren songs for those who seek what lies behind them, for those who feel homesick for a place they've never been to. Those who seek, even if they do not know what or where, is what they are seeking. Those who seek shall find. Their doors have been waiting for them. But what happens next will vary. As somebody whose biggest dream would be able to wander into a library that exists outside of space and time and hold magic in the palm of their hand, this speaks to my soul in a way that I can't explain. This speaks to the library of my soul. I can just 
put this on the shelf of the library of my soul. Aaron Morgan Stewart, goddamn, I love you. Something very similar to that one is another one that is welcome in the library of my soul, and that is The 10,000 Doors of January by Alex E. Harrow. You'll see that the concept of a doorway has had a large impact on me. <laughs> this follows January, who is the ward of the wealthy Mr. Locke, who took her in after her father, who worked for Mr. Locke, who went mysteriously missing after going on a journey to find a mysterious, possibly magical collectible. And one day when she's wandering a library, she finds out that she has the ability to open doorways to other worlds and sneak inside. And through a parallel of timelines, our author weaves the mystery of January and her family. This is set in an Edwardian London, so we do get commentary on like social class and racism, but that's also used as a foil and a comparison to all the other worlds that we get to visit, however briefly. Like this is Narnia on crack. <laughs> if you're an author and you think world building one world is hard, Try world building like 500, but in exploring how magical and fantastical each world is, we also get to see the small magics of our own world, and I can't quite find the quote, but it goes along the lines of, if you think that Earth is not magical, to a world where people are underwater, your ability to breathe air is a miracle. You see, doors are many things, fissures and cracks, ways between, mysteries and borders. But more than anything else, doors are change. In believing, Aid felt the scattered uncertainness of her youth falling away. If doors were real, then she would seek them out, ten or ten thousand of them, and fall through into ten thousand vast elsewheres. Alex just takes you on this journey of finding and belonging and loss and grief and family lines and like finding other worlds and finding where you belong and it's just so good and like makes my heart hurt and yearn for other worlds but then also it like turns that in on itself and it's like hey earth is magical if you just know where to look for it okay i feel like i might have lost some people you know i'm waxing poetic over here being very serious very emotionally open and some people are like i just i just came for books like i just came to to get some new recommendations like i don't know why she's about to cry over the fact that, like, over the number 10,000. Like, I get it, I get it. So let's talk about a favorite of many, many people, including myself. I can't count the amount of times that I've reread this, but it's a classic for a reason, and that is Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. Black pages! Ah! You can say any criticism you want of this book, and it will be like talking to a wall. I refuse to acknowledge that you say anything bad about my baby. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this Russian-inspired fantasy heist novel in the Grishaverse of Lee Bardugo, where a ragtag team of magic users and thieves has to go on an impossible heist. Why wouldn't you like this book? She's the full package. We have enemies to lovers, we have tension, we have chaos, we have magical shit, we have a heist. Who doesn't love a heist? This book just does all of the tropes perfectly. You know, we got the found family of reluctant allies that all get together and then learn how to love one another. And then we have the tension of the enemies to lovers that is like so well paced. The heist planning is just tricky enough that you as a reader don't quite know if it's gonna work out. And I'm pretty sure the majority of people who finished reading this spontaneously developed a kink for someone to call them their investment. <laughs> With morally gray magicians and crime bosses alike, we have fantastic interpersonal connections. And while I can't legally condone crime on this channel, something that Kaz says that really stuck with me is about how to properly steal something. That if you're going to steal a man's wallet, tell him you're going to steal his watch. Like, forget this live, laugh, love bullshit. You put that on a sign in HomeSense and that's coming home with me. To the FBI agent that's monitoring my Google searches, I've never stolen anything ever. All right, next up is a book that I am starting to feel like I need to reread again because every single fall, I re-listen to the audiobooks of the Raven Boys series by Maggie Steve Potter. I've talked so much about this book, you're like, Rachel, for the love of God, can you please shut the fuck up about the Raven Boys? Like, we get it. But this is my video and you wouldn't be here if for some, or maybe you are here because you just randomly clicked on this video but I'm assuming that you're still here because for some reason you like me in my opinion so I think that says a lot about you. The Raven Boys follows our five main characters Gansey, Blue, Adam, Ronan, and Noah. We're all searching for the legendary Welsh king of Glendower who is said to be sleeping along a ley line and whoever wakes him up gets a favor. Gansey is a rich boy treasure hunter with something to prove. Adam wants the favor and able to change his fate. Vicious Ronan has his hand on the pulse of dreams and Psychic's daughter Blue gets roped into the group when her and Gansey fate gets magically intertwined. Not only does this have that creepy weird nature magic with the sentient forest of Cabe's water, but it also has amazing interpersonal connections between 
all of them, the friendship dynamics are so strong. And it really talks about like what bonds people together. The romance is incredibly tension filled for a variety of reasons. And the magical line that connects Blue to the boys is constantly surging and retreating and changing. And there's so much in here about dreams and reality and time and timelines, time loops. Like, is this series perfect? No, there's a couple things in here that, you know, if it was published today, I probably would have changed. It still gives me that cracked open chest feeling of knowing that there is something bigger than yourself out there and just having the courage to find it. What keeps me coming back time and time again to this book is the writing. I don't know how or when Maggie Steve Otter acquired the technology from the movie Inception to get inside my mind and know exactly what's gonna speak to my cold dead heart, but she somehow did it. One of my favorite quotes is, she recognized the strange happiness that came from loving something without knowing why you did. That strange happiness that was sometimes so big that it felt like sadness. Or is this thing safe? Safe is life. Being Adam Parrish was a complicated thing. A wonder of muscles and organs, synapses and nerves. He was a miracle of moving parts, a study in survival. The most important thing to Adam Parrish though, had always been free will, the ability to be his own master. This was the important thing. It had always been the important thing. This is what it meant to be Adam. Oh, my heart. <laughs> also, the narrator of the audiobooks is Will Patton, and his voice with this story is just a match made in heaven. It's a match made in caves water. It's a match made in dreams. I'm just now realizing, except for one book on this list, there is some kind of doorway or gateway involved uh, in every one of these books. So like I said, I guess construction really made an impact on me when I was younger. But like, I love a good archway, you know? who doesn't because up next is yet another book that I have a tattoo from and that is A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab. You know I had to have at least one of hers on here if I have the whole Schwab shelf. You know redheads represent. This follows our main character Kel who is a blood magician that can travel through alternate realities of London and one day he accidentally smuggles something from one London to another one and stuff happens, consequences occur, the plot goes forward. Not gonna lie, I'm a sucker for a good map and I think that's partially why I was so drawn to this book because like ooh Urban planning just really gets me going. <laughs> it's crafty, it's magical, it's Victorian inspired. I love Kel's coat and the twisty magic of the artifacts that go back and forth between the Londons. The best friend brotherhood relationship that Reese and Kel have in this book is so wonderful. It's just, I love seeing male friendships. Maybe that's why I like a lot of these books. Cause like, hey, men can have friends, you know, that's a thing. And Lila's a certified grade one badass. So I love watching her take no shit from people. From Victorian London to the magical banks of the Thames, I love the world building that she did in this because again, we do have multiple worlds to build and uphold. And the way that she particularly uses color and scent in this to distinguish different people and different environments and even different Londons, scent memory is very powerful. And I haven't been in London for nine years and I still remember what the Thames smells like. Magic bent the world, filled in its shape. There were fixed points. Most of the time they were places, but sometimes, rarely, they were people. For someone who never stood still, Lila felt like a pin in Kel's world, one he was sure to snag on. I'm not going to die, Lila said. Not till I've seen it. Seen what? Her smile widened. Everything. A book full of pickpockets, pirates, and politics, A Darker Shade of Magic is one of those books that has just stuck with me for so long, and I still think that this is one of her best works. As Trevars. Okay, I need a caffeine break. Um, oh, the ice in this melted a very long time ago. Oh, yep. All the syrup just went straight to the bottom. I just got a mouthful of an entire lavender field. Okay, so we just passed the halfway point. And for the last however long, you know, I've been over here being like, I love fantasy and weird things that exist in dreams and like bees from other worlds. <laughs> this next book is truly like nothing you've ever seen before. And every couple of months I go, did I actually read that? Was that just a fever dream? And then I have to reread it. Um, and I just finished rereading it and I had a great time yet again. Uh, and that is Space Opera by Catherine M. Valente. Once every cycle, the Galactic Grand Prix rolls into town and sees if there's any new sentient planets in the galaxy. And if there are, oh baby, they are roped into the talent competition where they must lip sync for their life. This is a talent show 
amongst sentient creatures across the known universe. And if they are deemed not sentient enough, their planet and species get obliterated. And what do you know, Earth has recently been discovered by the Galactic Council and our main character is a washed up rock star who accidentally gets himself elected as the representative for humanity. And it's stakes like those that make me feel just a little better about that one time I got a C- minus on my humanities exam. This book is wild. It is squirrely. It is bananas. It is a mind fuck of a book to read and I love it every single time. This is just glittery lipstick, spandex, and microphone feedback in a book. The alien creatures themselves are incredibly bizarre. Like there's an entire planet of floating gas balloons all named Ursula. There's a planet where the only sentient life is a virus that takes on the corpses of other dead creatures, but they make the best burgers in the galaxy, so we can't obliterate them. And the highest award-winning author of the galaxy is an alien that looks like something that if a hippo and a chainsaw had a baby. As bizarre and ridiculous as this book is, there's a good amount in here on morality and mortality and what it means to be human, what it means to be sentient, but also what it means to not be alone in the universe. And like, I took one astronomy class, like I know how the universe works, barely. And you know what? I'm having a great time. The writing in here is very long-winded, bizarre, lots of metaphors, lots of extraordinarily long sentences, and I love how existential this book gets. In the end, all wars are more or less the same. If you dig down through the layers of caramel corn and peanuts and choking, burning death, you'll find the prize at the bottom, and the prize is a question, and the question is this. Which of us are people and which of us are meat? On Earth, it could be generally agreed upon, for example, that a chicken was not a person, but a physicist was. Ditto for sheep, pigs, mosquitoes, brine shrimp, squirrels, seagulls, and so on and so forth on one hand, and plumbers, housewives, musicians, congressional aides, and lighting designers on the other. This was a fairly easy call, for the physicists anyway. As brine shrimp were not overly talkative, squirrels failed to make significant headway in the fields of technology and mathematics, and seagulls were clearly unburdened by reason, feeling, or remorse. <laughs> Except that certain members of the clade felt that a human with very curly hair, or an outside's nose, or too many gods, or not enough, or who enjoyed somewhat spicier food, or who was female, or just happened to occupy a particularly nice bit of shady grass by a river, was no different at all than a wild pig. Even if she had one head and two arms and two legs and no wings and was a prize-winning mathematician who very, very rarely rolled around in the mud. Therefore, it was perfectly all right to use, ignore, or even slaughter those sorts like any other meat. No one weeps for meat, after all. So you're like, ooh, fun, happy, shiny, ridiculous, you know, karaoke night in space. But then also, and the existentialism of being human in a universe where we don't know who's next door. Life is beautiful and life is stupid. For this next one, we're traveling back to my YA roots and the reason behind my latest tattoo. And that is Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor. These new covers, oh my God, if I could wallpaper my house in this, if I could wallpaper myself in this, if I could wallpaper the library of my soul in this, I would. A couple decades ago, there was a war between gods and god spawn, yet for some reason, the events of the war and the city itself was wiped from people's memories, where our main character, Laszlo, is a library's apprentice who has an obsession with the lost city of Weep. But when a contingency of warriors rolls up into town, Laszlo is the only person who knows their history, and so he goes with them back to the magical lost city of Weep and has to discover what happened those many years ago. We also get to follow the children of the gods who are still alive in this city. Sarai herself is the daughter of the goddess of nightmares and her godly power is that she is able to call upon moths and also influence people's dreams. And like, oh wow, I love a book that has dreams and moths in it. Wow, what a surprise. Now this does have some pretty dark themes to it, um, but it's also the most whimsical of like any book on this list. I just love the way that Lenny Taylor plays with colors and plays with worlds building and her specific type of magic is just so like bright and inviting. I love Laszlo so much because he's just this sweet librarian who's like doing his best but then he like learns how to like do all these new skills. He's just like he's just happy to be there and then seeing the sacrifices that Sarai has had to make for her family and trying to keep them all together and keep them safe and the two of them have this Romeo and Juliet romance in a backdrop that is full of old gods and old world technology. One of my favorite quotes that Sarai says is dream me something beautiful and full of monsters. I mean, this is the best kind of reader wish fulfillment, right? Like you're going, you have the chance as a reader to go into the story that you love so much and you get to go to the magical mythical places that you've been studying. It was impossible 
But when did that ever stop a dreamer from dreaming? Okay, we've done fantastical and whimsical, and now we are going to get into the macabre, into the weird, creepy, fairy-type magic that I love. Those differences that like reach that uncanny valley, but in a more natural, organic state, and see things that are twisted and rotting, but still recognizable. And the book that perfectly embodies what I mean when I say that is House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. This follows the three Hollow sisters, who when they were 10 years old, went missing in the streets of Edinburgh for one month. And when they came back, their eyes turned black, their hair turned white, and they became the biggest media mystery as they tried to figure out where they had gone and why they have no memory of their time away. 10 years later, we follow Iris and her sister, Vivi as they both have to track down their third sister Grey who has gone missing once again. This book is described as darkly seductive and I think that's a fantastic descriptor of it because it's so creepy and weird but like you can't stop reading. It kind of like draws you in and then it pulls you in. And then there's a lot of gross stuff in here that I'm not gonna read but it's like flowers bursting out of people's eyes and blood rotting from the inside out. Creatures showing up with too many limbs or too black of eyes. This is a gross gothic mystery that really asks the reader, what would you do if you found out you were the monster? But there's also big themes of sisterhood and family and what makes a family. All put to the backdrop of the glittering fashion industry, rocker gay bars, and the old secrets of rural Scotland. I love how weird and twisted this book is. The kinds of natural and unnatural magic that are all described in a way that is just slightly off of what you would imagine her to describe it as. This is a perfect example of how word choice can really affect your reader. So maybe writers, this would be like a good study. Sometimes in the middle of the night, our parents would wake to check on us and find us huddled together in our pajamas, our heads pressed together like witches bent over a cauldron, whispering. Our eyes turned black, our hair turned white, our skin began to smell like milk and earth after rain. We were always hungry but never seemed to gain weight. We ate and ate and ate. We even chewed in our sleep, grinding down our baby teeth and sometimes biting our tongues and cheeks, so we woke up with blood-stained lips. The stench exploded out onto the street, soaking the air. It hung from the branches of trees like necklaces and took weeks to fade. Her writing is something that I didn't know that I was looking for until I read it. We are reaching the end and I realize that the last two books are on very opposite sides of the spectrum to one another, but Second Last is very similar to House of Hollow and it's actually one of the books that I comped it to when I read this last month, July, June? I don't know, time doesn't exist anymore. But Ava Reed has made a lifelong fan of me after I finished reading Juniper and Thorn, which is a gothic horror retelling of the juniper tree that just sunk all of its roots and teeth into my black dead soul. In case it wasn't obvious, this book is also gross. It's full of blood and bile and black magic and curses and stabbing people in the back metaphorically and literally. This follows Marlon Chen and her two sisters who are trapped in their home by their xenophobic magician father who is in the middle of a city that is rapidly urbanizing. But at night she sneaks out and starts a new secret romance with the beautiful boy that is the new principal dancer of the ballet. But as she falls deeper and deeper in love, the curse upon her father grows darker and darker and she's caught in the middle of blood and history and dark magic and want. This is another perfect study in language because I love the way that she describes things. Uh, like in this one, she talks about the workers in the city, how they were all stretched out and skinny like a length of dirty gray rope, their ends fraying and their eyes dull as knots. This one, she's talking about her father being a thin man, his wrist bones pushed up against his skin like air bubbles and cake batter. I can't find it, but there's also another quote in here about her sister's collarbones being like two knives under her skin. And just the way that she describes things is like, why would you say it like that? Her word choice is just perfectly unsettling and it just keeps the reader on edge the whole time. But what I really love about the structure of this book, you know, to get technical, to put my thousands of dollars of English degree to good use, our main characters kind of know she's in a story. It doesn't break the fourth wall, but because she is a magical being, she knows the signs and warnings to look out for. So it adds an extra tension of knowing something bad is going to happen and kind of falling back on the fairy tale rules to figure out a way to stop it. I reveled in this book. And if you are somebody that really likes me Grimm's fairy tales, but you like the original fairy tales where, you know, instead of Cinderella, stepsisters just getting exiled, they like get their feet cut off. Uh, you're gonna love this book too. It's okay, we're all a little monstrous on the inside. And oh my god, lastly, <laughs> we made it to number 10. <clears throat> all right, one more, let's go. Lastly, 
is a book that I read over a decade ago that has made such an impression on me. I still stand this book as being one of the best books that I've ever read in my life. The Romance, The Magic, The Found Family, The Yearning. <sighs> Clockwork Princess by Cassandra Clare. <laughs> Come on, all you knew it. You see how many Cassandra Clare books I have over there. It's nigh impossible that one of them didn't make it onto this list. Pretty sure all of you know at this point, but this is the third one of her Infernal Devices series, which is the Victorian Shadow Hunters trilogy. And I still sit like, this is my favorite trio that she's ever done. We get to see the peak of Jem and Will's relationship together. I love that they are, you know, bonded Parabati warriors who would do anything for each other. And the way that they both interact with Tessa like <sighs> I'm never gonna get a love like this in my life the way that there is just so much love and respect and selflessness within all three of these characters coming together and like trying to find a way to make the other people happy but also chasing their own happiness and then realizing that all good things must end it's just like ah my heart like yes this book is very over dramatic but it's Will Herondale what are you expecting Tessa's a tall bookworm so like, love her. And Jem is my Silver Prince Simon role, who just is so kind and lovely and plays the violin and wants what's best for his family. And then, you know, angels and demons and ancient curses and silent brothers and werewolves and steampunk fantasy. Okay, so this came out in 2013. So I would have been about a 17, 18 at the time. I remember picking this up the day that it came out, because of course I did. I brought it home and I started reading it after dinner at 6 p.m. I one shot at this book, until four in the morning. And I remember from about 2 a.m. onwards, sobbing my freaking eyes out in my childhood bedroom. I was trying so hard not to make noise because I didn't want to like wake my parents up. And that visceral reaction follows me to this day. Every single time I read this, I cry like the little bitch that I am. And really I could quote this entire book. Like if I was gonna like annotate this book, just the entire book would be highlighted. But this gave me some of the most romantic and heart-wrenching words that I've heard in my life. And I'd like to read some of those to you. Now I need you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. For you to be my eyes when I do not have them. For me to be my hands when I cannot use my own. For you to be my heart when mine is done beating. Our hearts, they need a mirror, Tessa. We see our better selves in the eyes of those who love us. What I do know is that if we are born again, I will meet you in another life. If there is a river, you will wait on the shores for me to come to you so we can cross together. And of course the classic, I am catastrophically in love with you. I am currently single, so if any hot shadow hunter men would like to put in an application, I can, you know, handle a sword pretty well and I wear a lot of black, so I'm already halfway ready for the Shadowhunter world. And that is that on that. We did it, everybody. Oh my God, there's my top 10 favorite books of all time. My camera battery, my caffeine levels, and my ability to be funny are all dangerously low. So we're gonna try and wrap this up real quick. <laughs> Please leave down below some of your favorite books. It doesn't have to be 10 just like in general. And really there are so many that I could add to my own list. I was thinking of doing like an honorable mentions category, but that would literally be me like pulling out half my bookshelf. People have asked me before, like if you don't like a book, what do you do with it? And I fully get rid of books that I don't like or I pass them on or whatever. So all the books that I have on my shelves are like me curating a library of books that I love or that gave me a reaction or that I want to reread again. So everything you see here is something that I really, really love. Like if it's under a three stars, it's gone. So that made it really difficult to figure out which ones I was going to pull. And there are plenty of other ones you can even like see within frame that I'm like, oh, that like spoke to me. And like, oh, this one was so freaking good. Or like this one was one of my last favorite ones of last year. But those 10 are the ones that I keep coming back to, that I keep thinking about, that when somebody says, quick, give me a favorite book, those are the ones that come to mind first. I have plenty of other diverse fantasies and like really hardcore sci-fis and like weird warped fantasy novels that I could have put on here that again, would be honorable mentions, uh, <laughs> but I don't want this video to be longer than it. I'm sure it already is. I didn't even mention any romances. I mean, I love them, but these are the ones that I love more. Like lots of mothers don't have favorite children but I absolutely do and that's why I'm not having kids <laughs> it's my book babies just all of these are my book babies thank you all for tuning in this morning afternoon or evening or late night wherever you are I don't know your life choices maybe it's 2 a.m where you are who knows but thank you for coming with me on this journey of me just yelling about stuff I like for like half an hour which to me is just friendship so I guess we're besties now but yeah also quick side note if any of you ever like see me in real life like 
absolutely feel free to come up and say hello. I've been at a couple of Pride events the last few weekends and I've gotten some messages later from people being like, oh, I saw you. Why didn't you come say hi? Like, don't feel intimidated. I'm a regular, normal person who for some reason people have followed on the internet. Like, that's it. I work a regular nine to five and like buy my groceries from Walmart, okay? No, I am tall, but I swear I'm not scary. I just like wearing shoes with platforms in them. <laughs> Remember, you can get my shirt at the affiliate link in the comments or anything else from the site for that matter. You know where to click like the video. You know where to click to subscribe. I hope you guys are all having a nice day wherever you are and I will see you all next week. Bye!